They used individuals under drugs in combination with hypnosis to see if they could put the person into such a trance that they would go off and assassinate somebody. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Frank Olson was an American biological warfare specialist. In 1953, at a meeting in rural Maryland, he was covertly dosed with LSD by his boss, Sidney Gottlieb, who was the head of the CIA's MK Ultra mind control program. Nine days later, Olson plunged to his death from the window of the Hotel Statler in New York. The US government first described his death as a suicide and then as misadventure, while others allege murder. We speak with Paul Vidic, the acclaimed author of The Coldest Warrior, An Honourable Man and The Good Assassin. He is also the nephew of Frank Olson. This podcast relies on listener support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available for free. You can support my work and help preserve Cold War history via one-off or monthly donations. Still not sure? Here's one of our financial supporters. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. If you're interested, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps me get new guests on the show. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations. We're on Twitter at Cold War Pod and Instagram at Cold War Conversations. So back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Vidic to our Cold War Conversation. My uncle, Frank Olson, uh, who was a bioweapon scientist, he um, had been, he received his PhD in uh, biochemistry in 1938 from the University of Wisconsin. And he had joined, like most young men, the Reserve Army Corps and was called to active duty in 1942 as a captain. And because of his special background in biochemistry, he was transferred to Camp Dietrich, which then became Fort Dietrich which was a new facility in Maryland that the Army was building to research, test, um, and deploy biological weapons and the protective gear needed for the American troops in the event that there was, um, you know, the use of biological chemical warfare agents. It was a unique place, a sort of parallel facility to Los Alamos, which is where nuclear bombs were being built. In Fort Dietrich's case, it was a um, bioweapons facility, equally secret, equally secure, and one that people know a little less about. Was it purely weapons or were they using drugs for enhancing interrogation as well? Uh, It started off building bioweapons because that was a threat during World War II. When World War II ended and the Cold War began, the nature of the threat changed. And at that time, uh, there was a lot of concern, largely as a result of Korea, that weapons were being developed by China and or the Soviet Union to uh, alter people's behavior. And there was uh, a lot of concern, sort of the Manchurian candidate concern that uh, politicians or scientists uh, traveling from the United States overseas would be um, apprehended and given drugs. Uh, And through the truth-telling qualities of these drugs, they would divulge secrets. So to protect against that, 
the United States at Fort Detrick was developing similar drugs and developing protocols to defend against that type of offensive use. In World War II, obviously, they were initially concerned about the the Nazis developing or deploying these weapons. But uh, with the advent of the Cold War, their focus then turns towards what was feared to be Soviet progress towards these forms of warfare. And so Frank then becomes involved in that. Correct. Initially, he was part of what uh, the sort of an MK Ultra predecessor organization called um, the Artichoke Committee. And the Artichoke interrogations were done by U.S. personnel, usually in teams of three, and they performed interrogations on double agents, security risks, and other covert operatives to extract information for American intelligence. Um, and these teams happened to be sent to Korea, France, Germany. The interrogations generally used uh, sodium emetol, sodium pentothal, and at one point they began using LSD, uh, and all of that in conjunction with harsh physical treatments, sort of a precursor of the harsh interrogations that were used after 9-11. The artichoke interrogations often tried to explore um, sort of an extreme type of behavior. And in one instance, they used individuals under drugs and in combination with hypnosis to see if they could put the person into such a trance that they would go off and assassinate somebody. And then this person would come back, be administered electric shock treatment and other sort of, you know, treatments that would wipe clean the memory of you know, the criminal act. And so this, all of this was really the brainchild of Sidney Gottlieb, who was part of technical services in the CIA. And, and these behaviors and, and procedures were all part of an effort to weaponize you know, drugs in the Cold War. Everyone is afraid of the bomb, but uh, you know, short of using a nuclear weapon that would create a World War III, they developed all of these other approaches towards uh, offensive activity. Frank is recruited into the Special Operations Division. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so Special Operations Division in any organization is always the part of the organization that does the things people don't want to talk about. It's the, uh, that's where in the CIA, it's, uh, it's a place where covert work is done. And it's a, it's an oddly named unit. But in the case of Fort Detrick, special operations took Frank uh, beyond the confines of uh, Fort Detrick, involved a lot of travel involved sort of the weaponization of biochemical um, activity that was, you know, very research oriented. And that's what took him into these harsh interrogations in France, Germany and elsewhere. Did Frank have a particular speciality in this area? His speciality was uh, anthrax and specifically the airborne delivery of weaponized anthrax. Aerosol delivery was one of the the things that was researched pretty heavily at Fort Detrick, and they had a, a, a very large uh, airtight container. And what they would do is test the aerosol delivery of anthrax on, on monkeys, and and that was part of Frank's job. And uh, I do remember my aunt, his wife, who, you know, didn't know what Frank did, but he knew that when he came home at lunch and it was in a depressed mood, that the monkeys had died. And it was sort of the, the unspoken expression uh, of her of his, his sort of sympathy for the dead animals that sort of led her to understand what his work in, was involved in. What sort of weapons were they developing there? I mean, was it very almost James Bond-like with, you know, lipsticks and pocket sprays and things like that? 
Fort Detrick history is still sort of wrapped in a lot of mystery and secrecy. What we what we do know is that there were a, a number of weapons that were used in the Korean conflict, and um, the Chinese displayed some of the weapons that were used. So, for example, some of them were common household items that were laced with anthrax and then dropped by air. So you had combs that had anthrax spores on them that were dropped in North Korea and and similar things, all of which were intended really as almost as psychological weapons. They were not intended to, you know, kill large numbers of soldiers. But if you created fear in, uh, in the population, that there were, you know, this mysterious illness uh, that was, you know, coming down on them, that would create political and military challenges. And so those were the so- sorts of things that were being done at, at Fort Detrick. They developed the, the, the sorts of weapons that the political and military establishment thought could be used effectively, you know, it, specifically in the, the Korean War. The CIA were dropping these uh, these combs with anthrax, um, but it wasn't an official part of the war. Uh, in fact, it wa- remained a secret, and the United States to this day has not conceded that it ever used banned biological weapons in the Korean War. But it, it I think the the preponderance of evidence. Uh, from now a variety of sources, 70 years after the fact, suggests that they were in fact used. And they would have been researched, and built and deployed uh, from Fort Detrick. And Frank Olson would have been involved in, in part of that process. So, so in effect, Frank Olson possessed state secrets that were important to keep hidden directly results to the circumstances we'll um we'll describe in in a little while how did frank then become involved in mk ultra directly as he was promoted to acting head of the special operations division uh he then became more involved with operations outside of fort detrick specifically with the uh with sydney gottlieb We believe that at some point during that time, in 51 or 52, he joined the CIA, his cover being that he worked at um, Fort Detrick, but in fact took his orders from the CIA. If if you were going to describe what the MKUltra program was as an overall description, how, how would you describe it? The CIA's effort to uh, modify an individual's behavior by covert means. Um, So they developed in response to, obviously, concerns of what was going on in the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, biological and chemical agents that they used in interrogations, in brainwashing. And the CIA took a defensive approach towards what they knew that the Soviet Union was doing. So there were there were reports in 1952 that the Soviet Union was engaged in um, intensive efforts to produce LSD. And it was also known that the Soviets um, were attempting to purchase the world's supply of chemical LSD, which at that time was only being produced in one place, which was the Sandoz factory in, uh, in Switzerland, I believe. So th- this idea that you know, the, the arms race at that point in time was not just about nuclear weapons. The arms race was also about biological chemical weapons, which could be used for a variety of things, including interrogations, intelligence development. Um, And obviously, to accomplish that, MKUltra needed to test the drugs on on individuals. And and so part of MKUltra was to find unwitting 
people who who would be you know given LSD and and then they would observe uh, the consequences of the drug on the person and they began to shape their view of the drug and how it could be used as an offensive weapon as a result of that research. Did the CIA share any of their research with the UK? Because I know that Porton Down in the UK was doing research into LSD as well. Uh, yeah. In fact, Frank Olson was the liaison from Fort Detrick to Porton Down. And uh, it, there was one research scientist at Porton Down who uh, he shared his doubts about the nature of his work. And it was, a, it was a bit of a breach of protocol. He had been in Germany. He'd witnessed an extreme interrogation. Presumably the inter- interrogated prisoner died. And when he, when he visited with his friend at Porton Down, he said more than he probably should have said because uh, his doubts about his work then were back-channeled to the CIA. And and in some ways that began a bit of the unraveling of his uh, position uh, at Special Operations Division. You said earlier that obviously he was disturbed by the trials on the monkeys, but for him to see humans suffer and for people to be potentially interrogated to to death with experimental methods must have been extremely disturbing for him. Yeah, in fact, it's, you know, this this case has been one in which, you know, every five or 10 years, new information comes out. Um, and some sometime along the line, my cousin, Eric, who is Frank's son, who's the one who pursued this investigation over his, you know, mostly his entire life, uh, came across one of Frank's colleagues, a guy named Norman Conoyer, who had worked in um, Fort Dietrich with Frank. And um, at one point in, I think, 1952, Frank had come back from Europe and he met with Conoyer and during his last trip uh, over there. And he said to Kenora, I want to quit. And um, in this conversation, Kenora had with Eric a number of years, many years later. Um, but he, he um, Frank then went on to say that, you know, I can tell you things that I can't tell other people because they don't have top uh, secret clearance. And he went on to say that, you know, what he had seen in Germany, and he said, Norm, have you ever seen a man die? Norm said, no. And Frank said, well, I did. My uncle was a, who I know, who I met, obviously I was a very young child, but who my father, who was a professor of sociology at the New School in New York, um, knew quite well. Um, and there was a, a, a very memorable conversation between these two men uh, at a house we have in the Adirondacks. It's a summer home in the woods on a lake. These two men in 1953, and this would have been August 53, a few months before Frank died, were repairing the roof together. You know, so they spent a number of hours together. And it, it was in this, in this conversation that uh, my father saw a change in Frank, a guy who had been sort of the hail fellow well-met type, you know, gregarious, outgoing, always the guy with the joke, was was sullen, uh, depressed even. Um, And he said that he had begun to read the Bible. My father was surprised and, and of course, no, nothing in the conversation indicated what he did or, you know, what was on his mind, except the fact that this guy admitted that he had turned to the Bible for some sort of solace. And of course, many years later, in retrospect, that was a, um, an important conversation because it revealed something about what was on Frank's mind at that time. Indeed, which sort of brings us on to Thanksgiving in 1953, which is a pivotal moment 
in this story. Can you describe what happened? The week before Thanksgiving, Frank had gone to a business offsite at a place called Deep Creek Lake, which was an hour from Frederick, Maryland, where he lived and where Fort Detrick was located. Uh, and it was at Deep Creek Lake, and this was a you know a typical business offsite. They were given instructions to arrive. They were supposed to have covers of being screenwriters or um, you know other media types. Um, there were a couple people from the CIA, including Sidney Gottlieb and uh, a guy named Lashbrook. There were uh, a few people from SOD division, including Frank. And, uh, you know, the, the first night it was dinner. They sat around this uh, cabin. There was a fire in the fireplace. And they were given an after dinner drink of Contra. And it so happened that uh, a number of the people in the room uh, had LSD placed in their drink by Gottlieb. And it was a difficult evening for Frank. Um, He was on an acid trip, didn't know that he was on an acid trip until it was upon him. And he reacted badly psychologically. And he returned home to his wife two days later. And her memory of it was that he was highly depressed. And he said he wanted to quit. Um, And she talked to him and tried to get him to understand, you know, get him to say, you know, what what the problem was. And and he really, you know, he didn't confide in her, you know, all the things that she needed to know in order to address his his depression. He said he'd gonna he was gonna quit, so he went to the office and talked to his boss. And while he was at the office, the boss convinced him not to quit. So he went home and said, I'm not quitting, but they've asked me to travel to New York to visit with a um, psychologist. And uh, and this was a few days before Thanksgiving, um, 1953. Uh, and he traveled to New York in the company of Robert Lashbrook, who was uh, worked for the CIA, worked for Sidney Gottlieb, and uh, stayed in the Statler Hotel, which is now the Pennsylvania Hotel right across from Penn Penn Station. And the purpose for Frank's visit was to meet with and be evaluated by a security cleared psychologist. It, as it turns out, that this, this medical professional was in fact not a um, psychologist. He was an anesthesiologist. But because he had security clearance um, with the CIA, he was the one they elected to have to speak with um, Frank. And their conversations obviously are, uh, there's no record of the conversations, although I think there were one or two after action memos written by this medical professional. And every night, Frank would call his wife uh, at nine o'clock and uh, and talk. And, uh, you know, the the night before Thanksgiving, which I think was a Thursday night, you know, their last conversation was, um, you know, Frank saying, everything's fine. And and all of this is in the public record. My uh, aunt testified before Congress to this effect. and so she went to bed thinking, there's no problem, uh, and he'll be home tomorrow. The next thing that happened was that she received a knock on her door at 6 a.m. by um, Frank's supervisor at Fort Detrick. He was there to convey the news that Frank had uh, died. He had either jumped or fallen from the 13th floor of the Statler Hotel in New York. And for 22 years, that's all she or the family knew about Frank's death. And then she, you know, had to pick up her life and raise her three children, um, uh, living with this, uh, you know, her grief and, and this sort of dark mystery. 
One question I wanted to to ask is why do you think Gottlieb gave LSD to his own staff? What what was he trying to achieve or his colleagues? What what was he trying to achieve by that? He was asked that question uh, when he testified before Congress and didn't didn't answer it directly. Um, but I suspect that they considered LSD a truth drug at that time. And I suspect that they were concerned about Frank's mood, uh, his emotional state. Uh, he'd had that conversation with a colleague at Porton Down discussing his doubts about his work. He'd gone to his office and said he wanted to quit. And um, if you're Sidney Gottlieb and you're running these programs and you know what's happened in um, North Korea with anthrax, you've got to you've got to ask yourself the question is this is a guy, Frank Olson, who has state secrets in his head. He knows about what's happened with anthrax in Korea and he's witnessed these harsh interrogations. Um, what do you do with a guy like that? Um, the, you know, the Soviet Union had the gulag. You know, you'd send people off to the gulag when you didn't trust them and they disappeared. But in the United States, there was no gulag. So what do you do with a guy who's emotionally unstable and is and has state secrets in his head? And um, you got to deal with it. And I suspect they were. They gave him LSD to test his reaction to what might happen if he was put in, he was sort of pushed into a truth telling sort of unstable situation. And the result was that they made him more unstable. And then they had to deal with this individual who had state secrets in his head and who had been made unstable by a bad trip. Let's just go back to the the Statler Hotel because I think that the circumstances of his final hours are suspicious because there's another guy in the room with him, which is Lashbrook, who you mentioned earlier. And after Frank goes out the window, Lashbrook makes a phone call. Correct. He made one phone call. One phone call was recorded from the room after Frank went out the window. And it happened to be overheard by an operator. And this was 1953. So you couldn't make a direct call from the hotel room. You had to go to the operator. The operator had one of these old telephone consoles. You plug in the room and then you plug it into the outside line. And um, the um the call she stayed on the line making sure that in fact the call did go through and the the call was a it's it's one of those mysterious details that um you know you keep going back to to try and reinterpret to understand what was there hidden in the text or the context and um it it it, it so happened that uh, this woman um heard Lastbrook say calling from the room he's gone and the person he was calling was Gottlieb um and Gottlieb's reaction was well that's too bad and when you think about those words they're sort of emotionless here's a guy who's your colleague who is jumped out the window to simply say well that's too bad it's it's i think about those words the chilling heartlessness of the conversation and i wonder in my own mind whether their shorthand uh, of conveying the facts was simply because they had had a prior discussion and they knew just what gone meant. So it's, 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 it's one of those telling details, like so much in this case, where everything points to murder, 
and none of it points away. And the, the CIA, they said they didn't know what happened. They presumed that he had, had jumped, uh, or but he could have fallen. You know, there was, there, and in fact, the the police report um, that was filed, which was very, very brief, you know, used the phrase "jumped or fell." But in any case, his coffin was delivered. He was, she was strongly discouraged from looking at the body um, in a public viewing because uh, they said, you know, he was too damaged and it would be upsetting. So. Um, his body was brought back and he was buried the next day in a closed casket. In 1975, the Rockefeller Commission report, which had been uh, requested by President Ford to look into CIA misdeeds, all of it, which was a consequence of um, the CIA's involvement in uh, the Watergate break-in, um, made a, a brief reference towards the end of this 800-page document, um, citing a, an example of a uh, scientist, a uh, bioweapon scientist, unnamed, who had died falling from the 13th floor of a New York hotel after having been given LSD. And... The, the reason the family discovered this is because the press sort of fixed on this, you know, dramatic point, this little anecdote. And, and that's what was um, highlighted on the front page of the Washington Post and many other newspapers. The family read this and said, you know, that sounds a lot like Frank Olson. And I know personally, I was working in New York, going up the elevator and at the time, Newsweek had also fixated on this, and they had a cover photograph, a cover illustration of this man falling from a, a New York hotel. Uh, it's become an iconic image. And I was with a colleague, and I looked at that, and I said, you know, that's really weird. I had an uncle who died just like that. And, and sure enough, the family confronted the CIA. The CIA admitted it was Frank Olson. And it was then, 22 years after the event, that they discovered for the first time that he had been given LSD. And that became a, um, you know, it's a powerful event, you know, this, this mystery that had uh, consumed the family and created, you know, deep personal issues within the family. Suddenly there was this, somebody opened the blinds, light was shed on this issue, and it said, if you had to rethink your life in a way, and my cousin, Eric Olson, you know, who was a PhD from Harvard, you know, attacked the problem as he would have, you know, any other thing that uh, he, he wanted to uh, do a good job with. And um, they held a press conference out of, in front of their home and, and, say we, and they said that we are the family of Frank Olson. And they sort of, they implied that they were going to file a lawsuit and that they were going to uh, do whatever was needed in order to find, to get the facts of the situation. Uh, and of course, they were a very sympathetic family. Here, they, you know, very accomplished. You know, the mother had sort of survived the suicide of uh, her husband. Uh, one child was at Harvard, you know, the other two were accomplished in their own ways. And and so the press focused on this. I happened to be at that press conference with my mother. We were in the back. He had Leslie Stahl from CBS there. There's deep, deep empathy, you know, from the press and the public that this family had been so deeply injured and all of the information withheld. Ten days later, as a result of the the attention that the family got, they were invited to the Oval Office to meet with President Ford. Um, it was a 17 minute meeting. They were put in, photographs were taken. He offered a personal apology and a promise that, you know, whatever needed to be done in order to get to the truth would be done. And, uh, and it was an extraordinary meeting. 
because there had never been a situation where an American engaged with the government, you know, died so mysteriously and within 10 days is sitting with the president of the United States receiving an apology for a wrongful death. And uh, it's never happened. And it hasn't happened since. Um, you know, almost always the White House distances itself <laughs> from these problems. In this case, it was the opposite. And, and that itself became a mystery that continued to live on. Um, and, and, and then a week after that, the family was invited to have lunch with uh, William Colby, who was the head of the CIA at that time. So they were ushered up to his seventh floor private dining room at the old headquarters building in Langley, Virginia. And they sat to a sat down to a formal um, lunch with, you know, china plates and wine glasses. Uh, they brought their attorney. And in this, uh, William Colby handed them a dossier of about 55, 53 documents that they, that he said was the full file on Frank's death. And of course, it wasn't the full file, as they would discover over the years, um, but it was what the CIA um, was willing to um, uh, share. And it. it when when they went back and Eric and the lawyers began to look at the documents, it was a, a strange sort of set of documents because they were they were after action uh, reports uh, reports of you know how the organization had sort of begun to scramble to deal with this death and who talked to who and. You know, you had uh, the anesthesiologist sending in a couple of notes saying, this is what I talked to him about. But there was no context to this. It, it was really hard to understand what Frank did and, and how he got to this place. It was almost as if there was no prehistory. And so it was hard to sort of evaluate these documents with any coherency. And, 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 and so in some ways, the documents provided some answers, but they opened up many more questions than the answers they uh, you know, dealt with. And this was like uh, in uh, the, the spring of 1975. That became what I'll call the second phase of this very long story. The first phase having been the 22 years of silence. The second phase became sort of the the families struggle to uncover as much as they could about what happened. Before we we go on to that, I mean, I think it's really interesting that President Ford's chief of staff at the time was Donald Rumsfeld, a name a lot of people will be familiar with, and his deputy was Dick Cheney, who also people will be familiar with. And, and they had great concern that if the family had sued the CIA, then there might end up being disclosed some even deeper secrets as well. So there's this, you know, paranoia going on. And as you say, the meeting with President Ford was unprecedented and still is unprecedented as as well. So it gives you an indication as to how worried they were about how far any investigation could go. At that time, Ford was trying to put all of the CIA's um, crown jewels behind them. Crown jewels was the Colby's word words for you know all the illegal actions or quasi legal actions that the CIA had been engaged with in its first twenty five years, and it created a, a huge problem for Ford um, because uh, during 75, if you remember, the Ford came in in August, I believe, of 74. He had only 18 months left in his term. So in some ways, he was running for his next term, um, never having been elected to a senior office. He had never been elected to vice president or president. In any case, he had a lot of political agendas on his mind, 
And the last thing at that time that he needed was for more terrible dirt on what the CIA had done to come out. So at that point in time, even though the crown jewels had been you know, presented and displayed and discussed, there had been nothing about anthrax in North Korea. And there had been no discussion about the, um, really the MK Ultra and, and the harsh interrogations that had taken place in Germany, um, in Paris. And so that was all stuff that, you know, they wanted to, would want to, um, you know, keep secret. And, um, and, and we believe that in fact, the, the, the effort was made to silence the family. One, to invite them to the um, Oval Office. And my aunt was, you know, touched by that, you know, and, uh, and she and the family sort of were, were given a settlement, which they debated as family whether they should take or not, um, because part of the settlement required that they sign a release that they would never um, seek an action against uh, the government for any of the circumstances around uh, Frank's death. And they did, in fact, get a settlement. They did sign. And that the signing of that document uh, has actually prevented the family from uh, any further actions against the government. So they were effectively silenced. One of the footnotes in all of this is that um, it's very likely that Cheney, who was the architect of the uh, harsh interrogation program, or certainly an advocate of it, after 9-11, probably became familiar with that, sort of, that activity as a result of the Olson case, because the Olson case would have introduced him to what was going on in MKUltra, harsh interrogations, artichoke committee activity in the early 50s. And so there's this thread that, that, that connects the early 50s to things is further along in time as 9-11. It, it's sort of like a deep river where there are many currents flowing uh, pushing things forward in time. I, I like that phrase, a deep river with many, many currents. In, in 1984, the family take up an offer that was made to them by Sidney Gottlieb at, at Frank's funeral that they could come over and speak with him. Can you tell us what happened at that meeting? Yeah, it's Eric Olson, who sort of had pushed this quite a ways after 75, you know, decided that he, uh, he'd had enough. He went to Sweden. He tried to put it behind him, but he couldn't. And um, he returned in 1984 and determined that he wanted to, to get to the bottom of this. So he took Gottlieb up on his offer, which had been made to my aunt. And he... Um, he also decided that they were going to meet with Robert Lashbrook. So they met first with Lashbrook. He, Lashbrook, um, had retired from the CIA. He was a high school chemistry teacher in California. And uh, they, they met him, the three three of them. And, and it was, a, a, as you can imagine, a, a very difficult meeting. You know, my, my aunt, even before going into the meeting, you know, it became sick in the car, threw up. The idea that she would be in the same room with the, the man who murdered her husband was just an over overwhelming experience. And um, but they did go in. They did speak to him. He he was nervous. He um, he was polite, but he was nervous. And, and later, Eric, you know, compared what he said in the meeting to what he had said in the uh his testimony in, in Congress. And it was pretty clear that he had, he was changing his story a little bit and that he seemed confused about certain events that he had been very firm about um, in his testimony. So they came away feeling very unsettled about the conversation. 
not at all getting the answers that they thought would say, okay, you know, it is what he, what he said it was, you know, he fell or jumped. They, they felt that there was more going on. They then visited um, uh, Gottlieb, who had retired as well, and he lived with his wife in a, in a farm in Virginia. And, and Gottlieb is a very unusual character. He, he was raised as a Orthodox Jew in Brooklyn. He went to Wisconsin where he got his um, PhD in agronomy. He married a Protestant, uh, a woman named Moore, Margaret Moore, who was the daughter of a Protestant minister. And, um, it, and it was that that was sort of an interesting point because my aunt was also the daughter of a Protestant minister. And so when they visited Gottlieb and his wife, my aunt and Gottlieb's wife hit it off. Uh, they sort of felt something in common. They they both sort of had had been raised as Protestants. Uh, they they were young women who sort of had gone into the world to do good in the world. And and Gottlieb himself had, had sort of had that, that quality about him. When he left the CIA, he and his wife uh, basically traveled to India where they lived for a year ministering to poor and to lepers. And so this man who had been this uh, this dark dealing with dark issues, manipulating, you know, human behavior, put himself out there into the world to, you know, help the, the needy. And yet he was a very manipulative person. And, and, and sort of part of that manipulation, Eric Olson uh, experienced when they arrived at the front door of this farmhouse. Um, of course, um, Gottlieb knew they were coming, and uh, Eric, you know, they were met at the front door. And when he um, introduced himself, he looked at Eric and he said, thank God you haven't come here with a gun to shoot me. And Eric was immediately sort of thrown off balance. You know, how, the idea that he would have you know, brought a gun to shoot this guy, immediately sort of uh, made him in some ways feel both angry at the guy, but also sympathetic to the guy. And and he, he, he felt afterwards as he thought about this, that this was the, the sort of the manipulative behavior of somebody who wanted to control the narrative of the meeting. And so the meeting itself you know, didn't produce anything of interest. Um, they were very polite. They talked, you know, Gottlieb talked about, you know, why he got into the business. He said it was for the same reason that Eric's father had gotten into the business. You know, during the war, the everything was uh, at risk and um, our way of life in the West was at risk in the Cold War. It required um, extreme measures. And so he's you know, very sophisticated, uh, very intellectual individual, but also very manipulative. And when they left that meeting, uh, they were no closer to, to believing they had the truth about what happened to Frank Olson. Indeed, indeed. And, and Eric waits another decade and, until his mother dies before taking the next step. Eric felt that uh, the best way to uh, answer some of the questions was to exhume his father. But my aunt um, refused to allow that to happen. You know, she said, this is over. We, we know what we need to know. Let's move on. So it was only after she died um, that he, that Eric uh, engaged, you know, an individual who was willing to exhume the body and examine it. Um, the individual happened to be a, a very noted pathologist by the name of James Stars, who had been involved in several other cases, you know, high pro profile cases in which he sought to find clues to deaths by examining the remains. 
So he received the needed permits. Um, they had the casket removed and then they opened it. And, um, you know, Eric was there in the room. Normally, <laughs> stars didn't pre- permit family members to be in the room, but Eric had been forceful in his desire to, to be there. And what they found was a, you know, a body well-preserved in a linen shroud, slightly mummified, but the casket's uh, seal had been airtight and uh, a lot of care had been taken to prepare, prepare the body for transport in 1953. So it was basically free of mildew and putrefaction. And, and Frank Olson was recognizable after nearly 40 years in the grave. And Eric resembled his father in some ways. And uh, it was, you know, obviously a, a very difficult moment for him to look down on you know, his father in, in the casket. And what stars found were multiple leg fractures that were consistent with a fall from 130 feet, which is what room 1018A was at the Stadler Hotel. The medical examiner's report from 53 had described multiple cuts and gashes on Frank's neck and face, which is why they had had a closed casket. Stars was therefore very surprised when he found no lacerations on Frank's head, face, or neck. And of course, that's what you would have expected to see on a man dressed only in a t-shirt and underwear who throws himself out a closed window breaking the glass as he goes through, which is what they said happened. And that surprised Starr. Um, but he also was surprised by another finding, and that was that uh, there was a fist-sized hematoma on Frank's forehead, um, which is sort of basically a raised lump. The skin above it was unbroken, but there was obviously some uh, old blood underneath. And The hematoma was not mentioned in the medical examiner's report, and Stars later, when he wrote his report, would conclude that the hematoma had come from a blow to the head in the room, and then Olsen was tipped out the window and murdered. I mean, that that is absolutely uh, fascinating, and I appreciate you sharing that because I'm I'm conscious that this is you know your your family and your uncle that you're that you're talking about there. Now I think Star also interviewed some people connected to the case, and one of them was Gottlieb. Yeah, he I think he did, but Gottlieb never changed his story and never opened up. He didn't get any additional information from Gottlieb and the CIA um, after their initial disclosure of documents. Never has never in any way commented on or participated in the long hunt for answers to the case. And so, 2002, Eric calls reporters to uh, his home and announces the new conclusion about what happened to his father. Correct. He, uh, you know, he he wanted to bring closure for himself for his own son, um, who I think was 12 years old at that time. And uh, he, you know, he assembled a, a presentation that started with Fort Dietrich in the 50s and then went through all of things that he had developed and discovered over the course of, you know, Basically, at that time, it was, you know, close to 50 years, all with the idea that they he wanted to put um, this to bed. And the the occasion was that they were going to reinter Frank's remains next to Alice Olson, his wife. And that's, in fact, what happened. You've written a book based around Frank's story, haven't you? I did. It's called The Coldest Warrior. It was a, my third book, a, a, in many ways, a difficult book to write because when you're too close to a story, the, you, you, you actually can't pretend not to um, be involved in it. And, and there are a lot of things that you know that, that, that don't appear on the page. 
So after one or two efforts uh, of trying to to write something that was, you know, what I'll call somewhat autobiographical or biographical in the case of, you know, Eric's journey in search of the answer, you know, how did my father die and why, I decided to create a fictionalized version. And, um, and by freeing myself from the facts of the case, I actually got closer to the truth of the case, I believe. There's a character in the novel called Coffin, who I give a speech to about truth. And the speech is on our Cold War was an artful victory of language. We used official language to create ambiguity, to shift meaning, and we used it to hide the truth. And of course, the book's epigram is from George Orwell's you know, famous line from politics in the English language, which is to quote, Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. And so in many ways, the novel is about how language can be used to shape the past and turn lies into truths. Sort of as a postscript, uh, you know, Frank Olson's death remains classified as undetermined. All the print and screen accounts of the case sort of stop at what I call the precipice of knowledge where the trail of evidence ends. Uh, in my novel, I was able to create a world that was not confined to the evidence. The novel offers one explanation of what happened. Undoubtedly, my explanation is precisely wrong, but I believe that is generally correct. Um, and the reason I wrote The Coldest Warrior was to be able to operate with the freedom that fiction enjoys to imagine a world beyond that precipice of knowledge. And I like to quote Albert Camus on that when he says, uh, fiction is the lie through which we tell the truth. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.